Salter was the first elected woman mayor in the country. I think it's hilarious that it really was, I guess, supposed to be a joke, and the joke was on them because she ended up winning. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. You can see how it would be somewhat easy to miss stories. Oh, right here. Yeah. How is this Susanna Medora Salter of Argonia, Kansas? It says female mayors are no good. If you did this, you were considered pretty radical. She's a kind of paved the way for women. It is pretty cool, it really is. Women do stuff all the time, but I'm not thinking over a hundred years ago. Kansas was, I hope that such equality could be carried out in other fields. It was exceptional, it was a fascinating history. The women got together and said, we need to be together and we need to have a vote. The first women's lib movement met with victory on August 26, 1920 when their right to vote was recognized by the Congress. There's so many of the same themes and issues that show up today. We're showing up in the 19th century. I think that those ideas still exist. We are still hearing those, those kind of sexist things. She raises her voice, I and mean, a lot of women do. She knew how it made her look. It's alternately soppy and bitchy. She'd stop it, but she can't help herself, can she? When she comes on television, I involuntarily cross my legs. Men are allowing women to take over the world. It is, quite frankly, revolting and disturbing uh, and extremely troublesome. I can throw a punch as good as I can take one. Oh, I still think that we're fighting against a mindset, right, that somehow women are, are not capable. Equality's coming. We're not there yet. The women ran and the women won. It's really a starting from the beginning of kids thinking about what is even possible for them to even do. The story of Kansas's trailblazing women starts long ago, years before the start of the Civil War. This bleeding Kansas era that really defined this state and Missouri as well. I mean, literally, this state shed blood in order to um, have it be a free state. Kansas was founded on principles of freedom. It came with a price. Kansas abolitionists fought pro-slavery groups in violent and often bloody battles. What does it mean to be free was a question that continued to be brought up time and time again. And women really used that to their benefit when they were fighting for their own equal rights. Many abolitionists believed in equal rights for all, including enslaved people and women. The violent movement to keep slavery out of Kansas helped spark the start of the Civil War. I'm Haley Harrison. A prominent figure in the Bleeding Kansas era was John Brown, but not even the militant abolitionist himself knew how his fight would lay the groundwork for another fight, granting women the right to vote. Early on, from the very beginning of Kansas being a state, you have women like Clarina Nichols, who came out here for the purpose of fighting for abolition, but at the same time, she was also fighting for women's rights. Strong women were drawn to the Kansas prairie. Abolitionist Clarina Nichols arrived from Vermont in 1854. The women's rights advocate was an editor of an anti-slavery newspaper and started speaking publicly about equality for women. Within five years, she'd gained enough signatures to enter the male-dominated political forum. The Wyandotte Constitutional Convention. So I love to highlight Clarina Nichols. At the Watkins History Museum in Lawrence, historian Sarah Bell explains one woman helped secure the first voting rights for all Kansas women. It unfolded at the state's Constitutional Convention. She was the woman who sat in the Wyandotte Constitutional Convention doing her knitting 
and not able to actually address the convention or be a formal delegate, but she was there in her negotiations with the male delegates after the formal convention during the day was able to grant women the right to vote in school elections. Clarina was quietly instrumental in advancing women's rights in the state. Two years after attending the convention in 1861, Kansas becomes the first state to broadly grant women the right to vote in school district elections. Women's suffrage leader, Mrs. Carrie Chapman Catt. The organized woman movement dates from 1848, when a convention to consider the rights of women was held in Seneca Falls, New York. The committee drafting the list of women's wrongs found her grievances against the government of men to be the same number that American men had had against King George. Political pioneers like Carrie Chapman Catt set their sights on Kansas. There was a ground swell of support in the town of Leavenworth from its mayor and newspaper publisher Daniel Anthony. His sister, Susan B. Anthony, was already one of the movement's most prominent figures. She wasn't alone. Other trailblazers at work in Kansas included Lucy Stone and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Suffragist hopes now rested with Kansas, patriots fighting for equality. Historically, Kansans themselves were calling themselves progressive during this 19th century. They thought it was going to be the first state to give women full suffrage voting rights. They so believed this. But even in a free state like Kansas, not even the fight for equality was equal. Pictured here is Mary Dillard, who was one of the more prominent African-American suffragists in the Lawrence movement. Mary Dillard, or Mamie, was the only black student in her graduating class at Lawrence High School. She joined the suffrage movement alongside other black women like Carrie Langston. Carrie's son and future poet Langston Hughes was Mamie's student at Lawrence's Pinckney School. But as these women demanded racial and gender equality, the women's suffrage movement was about to betray them. Unfortunately, at this time, African-American women really weren't as accepted within kind of the bigger organizations like that were led by Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth K. Stanton, a lot of those more, the white women that were um, leading those. Black men were also fighting for the vote. Susan B. Anthony was one of the voices decrying the effort, saying it would cause antagonism everywhere between educated, refined women and the lower orders of men. Her racist views shattered alliances with abolitionists who supported women's rights, like Frederick Douglass. Two years after the Civil War, Kansas becomes the first state to officially consider a women's suffrage referendum and voting rights for black men. White male voters rejected both. Three years later, black men got the right to vote with the 15th Amendment. Women still had a long battle ahead. Soon, other states west of the Mississippi began considering their own women's rights laws. And by 1893, 13,000 women nationwide were card-carrying suffragists. There's this great image uh, right after 1912 when Kansas actually did pass the right to vote for all women. And you see this woman walking across the country and all these states in her wake, all these western states that had passed the right to vote and going east. And this wave is going east. From the wave of progress, the tide was slowly turning in America thanks to a powerful alliance with another activist group, the Woman's Christian Temperance Union. The most shocking thing to me today is the fact that women are standing beside the men at the bars drinking. Oh, it's terrible. As recently as 1947, the Women's Christian Temperance Union meeting in Pasadena, California. The group, led by Frances Willard, championed prohibition. The time was when mothers and children stayed outside the saloon and wept. And now they can go inside and drag father out. The trouble is that very often the mothers and children have to be dragged out themselves. The union had more than 150,000 members, more than 10 times the number of registered suffragists. But women in both groups demanded the same thing, to be heard. Drusilla Wilson, who I just love that photo of her. She looks so stern. The Prohibition era is marked by strong images of female patriots, like hatchet-wielding cans and Carrie Nation, who used her weapon to demolish bars across the state. Carrie was jailed several times and sold souvenir hatchets to help pay her fines. And she wasn't the only one. Really to think about the understandings of social expectations at the time of women. 
So women really were not supposed to be in politics and they were not supposed to be out and like advocating for this in public. And if you did this, you were considered pretty radical and radical in the sense that you were stepping so far outside of these boundaries that you there was concern that you were not womanly enough, not feminine enough. As suffragists and prohibition supporters gained power, activists aligned with the Republican majority to push their cause. It worked. They were really politically savvy. Progressive Kansas leading the way for the nation once again, becoming the first state to ban alcohol in 1881. Alcohol is a detriment to you. Temperance Union chapters soon sprang up across the state supporting the cause. Some of the fiercest opponents of women's rights were anti-suffrage groups led by other women. One woman even taking pen to paper writing Kansas Governor John Martin. The suffragists have the persistency of fanatics and cranks. Her plea, keep voting rights away from women. But when Kansas lawmakers passed a bill giving women the right to vote in city elections in 1887, Governor Martin signed it into law. Women would have their say in the upcoming elections just weeks away. At that same time, deep in the Kansas prairie, in the tiny town of Argonia with its 416 inhabitants, a young mother of four was at home doing the wash, unaware she was about to make history. At the time, I mean, she's pretty young when this happens, right? Yeah, late 20s. Not even she could have predicted what was about to happen, and neither could the men who were behind the whole scheme. Call them feminists. I believe the influence of woman will save the country before every other power. Lucy Stone. And the circle Suffragists. The, the best protection any woman can have is courage. Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Patriots. We women demand an equal voice. We shall accept nothing less. Carrie Chapman Catt. Oh, can the circle Unbroken. Trailblazers, female political pioneers fighting for equality on the Kansas prairie, whether they had a choice or not. And our southwest of Wichita, Kansas, is a tiny town called Argonia. There, buried deep in the Kansas prairie, is the story of a trailblazing woman, Susanna Medora Salter. I met with some people and they had never heard of Susanna Medora Salter. And this has been 25 years, 30 years back. I'm always coming across stuff. <laughs> I can see that. Carol Pierce has spent her life preserving Susanna's legacy in her collection of articles, stories, and newspaper clippings. There's a lot of stories out there. Emerges the unlikely story. At the time, I mean, she's pretty young when this happens, right? Yeah, late 20s. I think she had two or three kids at that point. I mean, she was still doing all of the things in her household. Susanna Medora Salter was a supporter of the prohibition movement, but had no political aspirations. Yet, thanks to a new Kansas law signed in 1887, Susanna Susanna and women across Kansas were about to vote for the very first time, but some of the men in town had other ideas. Election morning, Susanna was home tending to the wash when she received a life-altering surprise. Her name was on the ballot for mayor. She was the only one of the women in that WCTU group who actually lived in town, so she was the only one eligible. It was the work of several Argonia men who, as legend has it, enjoyed their booze and their billiards and weren't about to let the temperance union dry up their town. Secretly substituting a woman's name at the top of the ticket, the Prohibition Party would suffer an embarrassing loss. Or so they thought. It's a really fascinating story because, honestly, it was an accident that she was even elected in the first place. Out of the town's population of 416, 98 voted in Argonia that day, 78 men and 20 women. She wins an out like, astounding numbers. Susanna was elected by two-thirds majority. Whether she wanted it or not, 
The 27-year-old mother was now the first woman mayor in the United States. Word spread fast. It says female mayors are no good. Why, Mrs. Salter has just killed Argonia. One of the men behind the failed election plot, Argonia's city marshal. He moved out of town and soon started sharing his story about how it all happened. We got full of whiskey and enthusiasm, and the undertaker got up in the middle of the meeting and nominated Mrs. Suzanne Medora Salter. I think it's hilarious that it really was like, supposed to be a joke, and the joke was on them because she ended up winning. There was little fanfare in that historic moment. Susanna found out that she'd won through a letter from the city clerk. You were duly elected to the office of mayor of said city. You will take this notice thereof and groom yourself accordingly. The young wife and mother suddenly had much more than a household to manage. Her husband was a little unsure about being the husband of a female mayor, but he did seem to come around to it. Governing was a family affair for Salter. Her father was the town's first mayor. Her father-in-law, a former Kansas lieutenant governor. Diplomacy was in her DNA, proven at the first meeting between the new mayor and her all-male council. Gentlemen, the eyes of Kansas and the United States are watching and waiting to see how I'll run things. I want you to know it's your responsibility, not mine, but I'll help you to the best of my ability. She called it her sugar policy. The first thing I tried to do was to make them think that they were the very finest men on earth, and after that, I had not a slight bit of trouble with them. She actually worked really well with the men that were serving with her on the council. Her term was one year. During that time, the town was hit by a tornado. There was a brush with some teenage vandals. The sidewalks were fixed and the billiards hall, she chased it out of Argonia. But the election was still the most noteworthy event. There wasn't anything too radical that she did during her tenure. But it does really, it's amazing to see the national press that was picked up by this first female mayor in the country. And women in Kansas, other suffrage leaders, were really supportive of her and tried to help her in any way that they could. Susan B. Anthony came out and visited her and was just amazed at this. The head of the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the National Prohibition Group. That's Frances Willard, pictured on the left. Also reached out. I wish you would write me on your official heading, a note that I can read to audiences showing the good of women's ballot as a temperance weapon and the advantage of women in office. With best wishes for the best mayor, I am yours sincerely, Frances E. Willard. Kansas was securing itself as the land of patriots, pioneers, and trailblazers. The same election that ushered Susanna Salter in as Argonia's mayor also saw five women elected to the city council in Syracuse, Kansas. A year later, Oskaloosa, Kansas elected a female mayor and an all-woman council. She really set the stage, I think, for is a good example of what women could do when they had that political power and actually had the right to vote. It would still take more than 30 years before women nationwide were granted the right to vote with the passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. And even though Kansas women were at the forefront of change, it would be more than 90 years before Kansas sent a woman to Washington. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. The last century has been one of evolution and revolution for American women, and Kansans led the way. In elected offices on the Kansas Prairie, to Capitol Hill, brave women, talented, in the skies. World famous pilot Amelia Earhart joins the National Women's Party in support of equal rights for women. And beyond. Yet for all their achievements, some things never change, especially for women in politics. She knew how it made her look. 
so alternately soppy and bitchy. When she raises her voice, and when a lot of women do, it reaches a point. Looking like everyone's first wife standing outside a probate court. <laughs> when she comes on television, I involuntarily cross my legs. And now we have the wicked witch of the west. Men are allowing women to take over the world. There's so many of the same themes and issues that show up today. We're showing up in the 19th century. You still see this kind of similar resistance. Can women do this? And what happens if they're not in the home? And who's going to take care of it? When voters elected 27-year-old housewife Susanna Salter as the first woman mayor in America in Argonia, Kansas in 1887, her election made headlines. But the focus wasn't on her political stances or leadership abilities. Newspapers would describe their dress, their voice, and a lot of just kind of trying to pick them apart in terms of you're not falling into this appropriate sphere of women. While in office, a Boston Globe reporter turns up to document this new breed of mayor. The mayor continues to be regarded as something of a curiosity by even her townspeople. Rather, the reverse of plump, weighing about 128 pounds, and is of a quick, active temperament. Her eyes are dark gray, and her hair, which she wears patted in the center and crimped, is of a blonde shade. She dresses neatly, but not expensively, making all her own clothes, and those of her children, whom she has four. We have had over a century of problematic coverage of women in politics, and that is not something that is going to immediately go away. In the book, Press Portrayals of Women Politicians, University of Kansas professor and journalism historian Terry Finneman documents the media coverage of four prominent women. Because most of the time women were supposed to be in the home. Including the first woman to run for president, Victoria Woodhull. They made fun of her a lot. They referred to her as Mrs. Satan. Montana's Jeanette Rankin, the first woman to hold federal office in the U.S. House. There were entire articles just based on the color of her hair and what she looked like. Maine Margaret Chase Smith, the first woman to serve in both chambers of Congress. If you are an older woman, well, you're dried up, you're too old, whereas men are distinguished, right? And the media circus that surrounded vice presidential candidate and Alaska's first female governor, Sarah Palin. You do see a lot of the sensational, a lot of the digging for very minute details, great emphasis on their personal lives. We don't notice these things casually on a day-to-day -day basis. But when you add them up over time, I looked at 1,300 newspaper articles, you start to see how serious of a problem this actually is. I'm proud to have served for six years as a senator from the Wheat State. When Nancy Landon Kassebaum arrived in Washington in 1978, she was elected into a man's world. She was the first woman senator from Kansas and the only female in a chamber of 99 men. Nancy was the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate in her own right. But there had been others before her. Dixie Bibb Graves served five months in the U.S. House of Representatives. I can conceive of no higher privilege. After being appointed by her husband, the governor of Alabama, to fill a vacancy. Kansas City Terminal Authority. So uh, it was little surprise that the new junior senator from Kansas would serve nearly two years as the lone female voice in the chamber. Serving in the United States Senate has made me even more aware of the federal government's growing influence. In those early days, it was her name that got attention. Senator Nancy Landon Kassebaum. She listens. She cares. Make a Landon with Landon. Landon was one of the most notable names in Kansas. Landon. Who is this man, Alf Landon? Nancy's father, Kansas Governor Alf Landon, suffered one of the worst presidential defeats in 1936, challenging FDR. The president was re-elected by a landslide. But at home in Kansas, he was beloved. And I had some of my opponents say, well, you're running on your dad's coattails. And I finally said, well, what better coattails to run on? I mean, you know. The Republican Party rejects this policy. He didn't want me to run. Really? Mm -mm. Mother did, who didn't care that much about politics. Hmm. But Dad, I think, he would never admit it, but I think he thought I'd lose. Hmm. And maybe he felt that ref reflect on him more than on me. 
<laughs> Nancy was one of three Landon children, and like Susanna Salter before her, politics was in her blood. When I was growing up, we did, and of course it was usually Dad who did the talking, but it was what was going on in the daily news worldwide, local news, uh, usually politics, too, of course. Political ambitions like a snake's tail never dies till sunset. Nancy's father never got to serve in the nation's capital. Nancy did, thanks in part to the trailblazing women who paved the way. I look back and think how much I admire the true grit of those women who were willing to stand up for what they believed was important. And while the road may have been paved, there was no map for one of the nation's first female senators. <laughs> Nancy's dedication to compromise on Capitol Hill earned her the moniker, Nice Little Nancy. More than 15 years into her tenure, not much had changed about the way the media told her story. Kassebaum, 62, is a five foot two inch wren of a woman whose calm, disarming demeanor stays unruffled amidst the overpowering swirl of activity in the Senate office building. I frequently ask, do you think you're being ignored in the Senate by some of your fellow senators? You know, are they just taking you for granted? And I said, and it's true, if you worry about that, you've lost the ability to really focus on the issues at hand. Hi. Early in her career, Nancy proved she couldn't be defined by labels. She broke rank with the Republican Party by supporting the Equal Rights Amendment, granting rights for all Americans regardless of sex. But she refused to support a deadline extension to ratify it. The decision cost Nancy the support of the Kansas Women's Political Caucus. She won't call herself a feminist and doesn't want to be remembered that way. She says all issues are women's issues. I care just as much about foreign policy uh, and uh, as I did uh, about uh, the Farm Bill <laughs> or about women's issues. I will vote to override this veto. In her 19 years on Capitol Hill, she's most proud of her work to place sanctions on South Africa for apartheid. Conditions in South Africa have grown worse. Even though it meant bucking her party's president, Ronald Reagan, Nice little Nancy, as she was called. The president's bill is vetoed. Persuaded 30 fellow Republicans to vote to override his veto. I think one that I'm glad to see have happened was the end of apartheid in South Africa and getting to know Nelson Mandela. From Washington to Topeka, where women have been serving in the Kansas legislature for 100 years. Over the Park Democrat Stephanie Clayton was elected to the House in 2012. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. She learned quickly that the rules are different for men and women in political office. People ask me this all the time. Well, who's looking after your kids? And it's like, well, uh, you, you might be aware that, you know, my children have a father. I'm married to him. When I first started, my daughter was eight and my son was two. And so when I would say that, the reaction was, oh. Uh -huh, that's right. And so that reaction that <gasps> is like, you know, what, did, did I murder somebody? Or, you know, it's like, obviously I haven't done anything wrong. Um, and then I'd be standing next to a colleague of mine who has eight children. And, you know, and his wife stays at home and they homeschool and it's totally cool if he does it. Now a century after the 19th Amendment granted women the right to vote, that old saying still rings true. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Sexist attitudes are ingrained. It's so normalized that I don't think that people really stop to think about it. So women keep working until the job is done. Politics seems to still be such a barrier. If history rhymes, then the poetry of tomorrow is being written today by the present day pioneers determined to change what the future holds for the women who yeah. come next. Let's go show them. Whoop, whoop, whoop. Okay. Ad Astra, her Aspra, to the stars through difficulty. It's the Kansas State motto emblazoned on the state flag. 
Kansas women have persevered through their fair share of hardship in the state's 159 year history. They led the way for the nation. It's a pioneer state after all, a free state. The first state to allow women to vote in school board elections. The first to hold a referendum on women's suffrage and home of Susanna Salter, the first woman mayor in America. It's a little known part of the Kansas story, but today more than a century of progress in the Sunflower State is under threat. She should have brought down her neckline. I'm voting for Romney just so I don't ever have to see this woman again. I wish you were as right about what you're saying as you are passionate about it. I really do. That's for example. Women had few rights at the turn of the 20th century. It was an increasingly common sight in the 1920s. A new generation of pioneers in Kansas gave birth to a new vision for the nation and women's role in it. The new female graduate could aspire to something more. The new poets and authors had told her so. The young man in her life could only react with consternation upon learning that she wanted individual fulfillment more than a gold band and bassinet. A hundred years ago, women got the right to vote with the ratification of the 19th Amendment. The fight for equality didn't stop there. I hope that such equality could be carried out in other fields so that men and women may achieve equally in any endeavor they set out. Kansas women at the forefront of change. For Rosie the Riveter, as she was known, there were such work-related happenings as Queen of the Welders contest. And while blazing new trails, mothers and daughters who were taught a woman's places in the home found their place in this house too. Cora arranged the vegetables in neat rows. In the 21st century, women of all ages are facing new possibilities. Who is that? Her mom. Cora's mommy? Modern pioneers charting a new course on a journey started by suffragists. Look at her. She snuck some of the food. Do you do that too? <laughs> I know you do. Women cite family obligations or sometimes finances as a few of the unique barriers holding them back from elected office. What gives you hope for, for the next 100 years? <sighs> Attorney Lauren Allen lives with her daughter Camille in Kansas City, Missouri. I believe that what's giving me hope is that my generation wants to see a change. We are actually bucking the system. I know they call us sort of whiny millennials, um, but we're making different changes, right? We are deciding to chart our own course. And I think that because of that, we're gonna see some differences as they play out over the next hundred years. And so I am just looking forward to seeing not only what my generation does, but then what does Camille's generation do? How much further will they take it. That hope for a better tomorrow is woven into Lauren's family history. When it came to civic activism, her grandfather and namesake Lauren Allen had a front row seat. I brought me a ringside seat so I could sit here and watch it. <laughs> From supporting the demolition of his neighborhood eyesore. This was, say I'm 30, so at least 20 years ago. To an unsuccessful run for Missouri State Senate. The beautiful thing about that is that my grandfather has a sixth grade education. Lauren grew up believing anything is possible. They've been saying it since I was a little person that you can be anything you want to be. I want to actually be able to see individuals holding positions where that becomes true. Lauren is thinking about following in her grandpa's footsteps and running for public office. Ambition is one ingredient. Coco. She has plenty of that. Oh, oh, oh okay. Oh, my head. <laughs> Two cups, and we need one more cup of flour. But as both breadwinner and a single parent, there are some major obstacles standing in her way. The same challenges many other women face when running for office. Campaigns take up a lot of time. They are quite expensive. So, you know, wondering about funding, who's gonna be those backers? The nonpartisan Kansas City-based Women's Foundation and a University of Kansas researcher looked at what's holding women back from life in public office. Number one, the confidence gap. Women don't think they're qualified to run. There's a statistic out there that says that a woman needs to be asked nine times before she'll run for office. And she questions herself regarding, you know, am I qualified, am I good enough uh, to do this? Number two, support. 
women simply aren't being asked to serve. Mentoring plays a big role. Women tend to need to be encouraged more to run. Kansas State Representative Stephanie Clayton from Overland Park was elected in 2012. She built her confidence to run at her church, the Rotary Club, and the PTA. I had also grown up in a family that was very political, you know, so my parents voted in all the elections. Uh, my dad held elected local office, you know, Mother was always PTA president, writing letters to the editor. I always enjoyed watching Dad sort of uh, perform, so to speak. Nancy Kassebaum was the daughter of Kansas governor and 1936 presidential candidate Alf Landon. As a young mother, she raised money to start a library at her kids' school in a closet, collecting, cataloging, and buying books. Soon, she was on the Mays, Kansas School Board. Next, the U.S. Senate. That's how I really got involved. And it grew from there to friends who were active with the League of Women Voters, uh, who said, it's a good time, Nancy. It's an open seat. Senator Kassebaum served nearly 20 years, the first woman elected in her own right to the 100-member Senate in 1978. Today, there are 26. At the time that I joined the committee, I was the only new person. Lauren Allen is now building experience and a resume for a possible future run for office. Getting on some of these city boards, uh, municipal boards, is like a good springboard for other opportunities. Is this the way it works? Tell me about this. Yes, I, I think so. I think once individuals are able to ha hear your name, they see what you're capable of, they know what your skill set is, it certainly opens up uh, so many more doors. To get more women involved in local government, the Women's Foundation started the Appointments Project. As a first time board member, I was so grateful to have the Appointments Project as a partner. The Appointments Project helped Lauren Allen apply for a position on the Board of Trustees for City Trusts, where this attorney is now using her knowledge of property laws. That's sort of what they help you navigate is Okay, I see this board has a vacancy. I think I can be of service. Now what? Candy is bone bone. Good, good job. The Appointments Project is now raising the next generation of leaders in Kansas, Missouri, and now Arizona, taking the fear out of campaigning. And then do we have some light up mummies? It's working. Ooh. Women sought elected office at historic levels in 2018. I'm happy just to see so many women putting their hat in the ring and showing everyone that we're capable. I have the skill set. We, we are powerful. I know what I'm doing. I am capable of doing this. The fight for equality is not finished. Oh, no. But I certainly hope we're not fighting for that in 100 years. <laughs> if I have to wake up on the other side of heaven and go, OK, they are still fighting <laughs> for the same thing, I certainly hope that that particular fight is over. With the legacy of political pioneers shaping our history, the next generation of trailblazers is facing a new fight. Get us to run. You can't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. Fewer Kansas women are entering the political arena, but a new kind of patriot is emerging. I'm right in front of the Illinois State Capitol right now. New women trailblazers making political change. This is the Kansas strike. Without being elected. So yeah, isn't it beautiful? Sunflowers are found in every Kansas County, resilient, adaptive. Ad Astra per Aspra, the Kansas motto, to the stars through difficulty. And like the sunflower, strength from hardship. In Topeka, under the State House Dome, women are adapting to change. Kansas has a long history of kind of uh, unusual, crazy politics. Nearly 28% of lawmakers here are women. There used to be more. The number of Kansas women serving in the legislature is declining. When a woman leaves, you know, one of the things we talk about, find your replacement. And what happened, a lot of women were here, but those women were not followed by other women. Men took their places. Nevada is the only state where women hold a majority in the state house. West Virginia is at the bottom of the list. 
And Kansas, the birthplace of female political pioneers, ranks 28th. A hundred years after women got the right to vote, the number of women serving in Topeka is actually dwindling. It's surprising considering Kansas is still home to some very powerful women. So help you God. I do. Congratulations, I really do. Democratic Governor Laura Kelly. Wichita Republican Susan Weigel, Senate President. Our leadership is over here. And the state's only elected woman in Washington, Democratic Representative Sharice Davids. Kansas back in 2000, was the, was fifth in the nation for the number of women serving here in the legislature. Oh, that's changed. Yeah. It has changed. Yeah, big time. 28th. Yeah. Now. Doesn't seem like that's maybe yeah. moving in maybe no. the right direction. No, but, I, you know, I will tell you, we are here from 7 o'clock in the morning sometimes until 10 o'clock at night. Um, you've got, you're just totally uh, engaged here. How do you leave to go to a band concert? Or if you've got small children, you've got to have help. Whether you're a mother, a homemaker, an accountant, a lawyer like I am, or a doctor, or a physicist, or an engineer, or a school teacher, um, we have a lot of demands on our time. Women have to be asked three, four, five, six times to run. Men don't. They don't even have to be asked to run. They do it on their own. Educator and Lawrence Democrat Barbara Ballard was the first African-American woman elected in her own right to the Kansas legislature in 1992. And she wants more women serving by her side. Get us to run. You can't win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. You can't win an election if you're not in the running for it. There were 47 serving in the 2020 session, and they're not the only female patriots making progress on the Kansas prairie. In her Manhattan, Kansas studio, I looked at a lot of suffragist pictures. Artist Jennifer Hudson yeah. has found her muse. Everything in here is a feminist theme. Feminism, you know, they think it's only about women, uh, but it's about equality between the sexes. Equality's coming. We're not there yet. Her pieces are striking. I also went back and looked at old Kansas uh, suffrage flyers. And they're being recognized on the 100 year anniversary of women getting the vote as part of a nationwide project. It's so dang big. I don't know if we can uh, kind of pull it out or not. The brainchild of Oklahoman Marilyn Artis it's called Her Flag. In my current work, I use the American flag as a vehicle to explore my feelings about being a woman in America. I went 36 states ratified the 19th Amendment, and then I went 36 states. That's it. That's what's going to happen. And so I went, I'm going to travel to all 36 states. And right after I said that, the rest of the idea spewed out. And that was that I was going to partner with a woman artist in all 36 states. And we were going to create a flag, except way bigger than this one. <laughs> Her flag will be 18 feet by 26 feet. And it isn't done yet. Hey. I'm right in front of the Illinois State Capitol right now. Each state, a different stripe from a different artist. I've done a lot of big projects in the past, so I knew that I could do it. I knew that I could do it, and I love road trips. With a sewing machine by her side, Marilyn does her work in state capitals, needle and thread weaving together more than 100 years of women's history and hopes for the future. Kind of swings back to this feminist idea of like when women couldn't have a job and we had what we were, what we were doing we were cooking and sewing in the house so I love kind of taking that sewing and reclaiming it one of the first stops on her flag's journey Kansas the state motto featured on the right means to the stars through difficulty applicable to both Kansas and the suffrage movement on June 4th 1919 the US Senate passed the 19th amendment giving American women the right to cast a ballot as soon as it was ratified. And so in its political trailblazing fashion, Kansas called a special session here at the state capitol on behalf of all women. I've now done four. This is the fourth state I've been to.
Kansas, Ohio, and New York were among the first to ratify the amendment. So in each capital city, I'm sewing the stripe that represents that state right there in the capital city. And the artist that created this amazing artwork is Jennifer Hudson, she's right here. Missouri followed suit a month later. Tennessee's yes vote on August 18, 1920, finally ratified the amendment, a milestone for America. Which takes us back to that phrase. History doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. Yeah, I gotta figure out where I'm going now. Argonia, Kansas is one stop on the complicated and winding road to women's suffrage. The home of the nation's first woman mayor, Susanna Salter. Other pioneers follow. A hundred years later, Kansas women are still blazing new trails. The part to me that is so exciting is the travel and making it and getting to engage with people and just be a joy bringer and to be present for them. And I'm not going to cry right now <laughs> and, and help people feel good for a minute about something related to America and American history. Kansas history is full of stories of female patriots, women willing to fight for what they believe in. But some of this history could soon be lost forever. There's a lot of stuff missing. We don't know where it went. It's just, it's, it's just missing. Kansas, there is a speck of a city called Argonia, an epicenter of women's history. Problem is, few have heard the story. Come in, come in. Apparently this was, is what they considered the dining room. You have your table with some early day china. At the corner of North Osage and Garfield Streets is the tale of Susanna Salter. She was the first woman mayor in the United States and it was kind of set up as a joke. The men of the town decided to uh, try to get her elected. They were making fun of her, uh, yeah, so. But the joke was on them. Right, in the end it was. That joke more than 130 years ago. We need a dust over here. Today is no laughing matter. What is your impression of this house and the condition that it's in as you're getting in here? Well, uh, it's obvious that it hasn't been cared for in a long time. There's a lot of deterioration. As somebody who loves history, how do you feel about the condition of the house? Breaks my heart. I can't believe that somebody that says they love this house would allow it to become this way. And this ceiling is still, that's just, ew. Is that what it is? I wondered about that. Yes, that's what all that is. We had this all cleaned up. There was a lot of leakage and the paper is falling in this room. In other rooms, there's plaster coming down. Susanna lived in a Gothic Revival brick home, built in 1885, two years before she became mayor. Well, this is going to be very dark in here. The home is on the National and Kansas Registers of Historic Places, though by looking at it, you'd never know. She has a, a great history. Parts of the home have fallen into ruin. So have the relationships between a group of local amateur historians over how to move forward. Makes me sick. The furnace hasn't worked since the 1990s. Roof damage is obvious. There were updates outside years ago, thanks to a state grant, but the home has never seen its former glory. Well, that stuff missing. We don't know where it went. It's just, it's, it's just missing. Do you have your suspicions? Yeah, we have suspicions. We do. So, yeah, I'm kind of shocked at the conditions in there, and things aren't where they used to be, and stuff is gone, so. Wow. And all of this, of course, happening as we're celebrating as a country the 19th Amendment, 100 years since the 19th Amendment. I know, Amendment. I know. The timing. Yeah, it's, timing's not very good, that's for sure, for this museum. It sure isn't. What are you guys hoping, what's your vision for what this place becomes? What would you want to see? Well, we want to get it back open and get tours in here and, and just get it promoted and just back the way it was. Would be, would be great. Valerie Wade is among those working to preserve Susanna Salter's place in history. Her mother, Carol Pierce, 
has been there since the start. They have seen it go downhill. And they want it to back up there again, and I do too. So, like I said, I've been in it since 1961. At her home, she has decades worth of articles and research about the nation's first female mayor, including the 27-year-old's own telling of how she won over the five men on her city council. The first thing I tried to do was to make them think that they were the very finest men on earth, and after that, I had not a slight bit of trouble with them. Gentlemen, the eyes of Kansas and the United States are watching and waiting to see how I'll run things. I want you to know it's your responsibility, not mine, but I'll help you to the best of my ability. She should be admired. It was, yes, she made history. During her one-year term in February 1888 and just shy of her 28th birthday, Mayor Salter gave birth to her fifth child, a baby boy, Edward Easter. He died days later. Within weeks, Salter and the men on her council passed their first and only new ordinance, appointing a gravedigger and caregiver for the city cemetery. The next month, Salter finished her term, left office, and quietly went home. I think in a case like Susanna Salter, when she herself was not pushing herself forward as, remember me, this was huge, I was the first, and you, that sort of gets pushed to the background as you have other big accomplishments and milestones that continued on afterwards. Those accomplishments, that history, are slowly being lost to time, like one of Susanna's tattered hand-sewn quilts. Oh, gosh. Uh, you know, I think this needs to be in something else because there's something on this quilt. Uh, maybe it needs to be stored better. I know that's the glass case, but there's something on that. When I came in here last May, it was, um, you know, it was heartbreaking. Our own local school children don't know about this. That's sad. So we're going to open it at local, and then we go to Sumner County, and then we're going to go farther to Wichita and whoever, you know. Get the kids in here. Let them know what it was like one of these days. Whenever. Susanna Salter's story now lives on through this small group of amateur historians and through articles and artifacts treasured and cared for by Carol Pierce. I just knew something had to happen because we wanted to honor her. There's only one first woman mayor, and she's here. Argonia's a small town. She put us on the map. Salter died in 1961, two weeks after her 101st birthday. She'd outlived three of her eight surviving children. I wish now I'd gone with my mom to see her. That's a lot of things in life you wish you'd have done. Either didn't have time or didn't take time to do it. When Salter's term in office ended, the family moved out of town, headed for Oklahoma. Mayor Salter became known as Mother Salter. Family said that she was assertive, outspoken, almost tactless, yet resourceful independent, someone who could darn a sock as well as she could fix a flat tire. On her 100th birthday, she sat with the female mayor of Norman, Oklahoma. A newspaper reporter was there to cover the occasion. In Susanna's lifetime, women had gone from having almost no civic rights to serving in elected positions from mayor's offices all the way to the U.S. Senate. The woman who became the first female mayor in America cherished her voice at the ballot box, quoted at 100 years old, saying, I've been a good Republican all my life, and I always go vote, city elections and all, take them all in. I look back and think how much I admire the true grit of those women. From the first Women's Rights Convention. When the women got together and said, we need to be together and we need to have a vote. To the 19th Amendment. I'm a bit of a history nerd and I love the suffrage era. Women's battle for the vote lasted seven decades. It's just filled with so many amazing stories and women and crazy things that you're like, what, what, what happened? The Sunflower State led the nation. Kansas has a long history of, you know, of, of kind of uh, unusual, crazy politics. A century later, the women ran and the women won. There's a new generation. I think public service is a great thing for women to do. Pioneers. I really admire anybody who, who has the guts to run for office in this day and age. Patriots. I'm happy just to see so many women 
putting their hat in the ring and showing everyone that we're capable. Trailblazers. <laughs>